You never see it coming. It could be bad timing, bad judgment, or just bad luck. But in an instant, your life changes. Our first case in point involves a late night, too much partying, and a fateful encounter. Now, what happened that night between a beautiful young woman and a man she didn't know would raise all kinds of questions about truth, justice, and what it takes to do the right thing. That's a really odd way for ABC to frame this story. See what I think when I hear, what happened that night between a beautiful young woman and a man she didn't know is, okay, this is going to be a story where she was victimized. But that's not what happened. What really happened is that a man was falsely accused by a woman and he went to jail for four years. However, ABC's framing of this story would have you believe that she was the victim, not him. Listen to this. Bjorni Pagero is a quiet, somewhat vulnerable soul. She's only 27 years old, but she's already been through enough challenges and tragedy to last a lifetime. See, they're trying to make the villain look like the victim. She's a quiet, somewhat vulnerable soul. She's only 27. Only 27? That's a full-blown adult. They also say she has been through some challenges and has had a tough time. Which makes what she did okay, right? Now keep in mind that I've spoiled the ending for you so you can see this report honestly. Because ABC has not yet told you that this woman put a man in jail for a crime he didn't commit, and they're withholding that information so we will sympathize with the false accuser, Bjorni. Then, by the time they reveal how much of a criminal she is, you won't be so critical of the horrendously evil act she committed. The way ABC presents this story is called framing. For those of you who don't know what framing is, let's use the Wikipedia definition because I think it's actually pretty accurate. A frame defines the packaging of an element of rhetoric in such a way as to encourage certain interpretations and to discourage others, which means that essentially the framing of an idea changes how you perceive it. If Chris Cuomo and the ABC team wanted you to perceive this story honestly, they would have done it from the viewpoint of the man who was actually the one who was victimized. His name is William McCaffrey. But instead, ABC tells this story from the viewpoint of the false accuser. This changes how you perceive the story so that not only will you sympathize with an incredibly evil person, but by the end of it, you will even think she's an outstanding individual. If there was ever a story that so accurately displays the media bias against men, it's this one. Let's get into it, but first, if you like the content you see on this channel, then consider making a donation. Viewer support helps keep me independent, and it helps fund a lot of the quality improvements that I make on this channel. Links to my PayPal, Patreon, and Subscribestar pages can all be found in the description. And also, don't forget to support me on Alt Tech. Links to my BitChute channel, my Minds page, and my Parlor page can be found in the description as well. Alright, let's talk a little bit about the backstory. I'm going to hand it over to Chris Cuomo to explain it for us. The story of what happened begins on the streets of New York City on a Saturday night in the summer of 2005. Bjorni's enjoying a girl's night out. As usual, she's with Aurora Pujols, a best friend who's really more like an older sister. As the night winds down, Bjorni and Aurora are sitting in Aurora's car while their friends pick up food from this restaurant. A group of men cruising for action pulls up next to them, inviting them to a party. So these random guys come up to Bjorni's friend's car and start hitting on her and her friend while they are waiting for other friends to come out of a restaurant. Bjorni's friend Aurora gets creeped out and goes inside of the restaurant to get away from the guys. Then, for some reason that wasn't explained, Bjorni drives her friend's car away from the restaurant completely drunk. I drink like five uh, blue Hawaiians. Five is a lot. Five is a lot. So, so. you're drunk. Definitely drunk. Bjorni takes off in her friend's car. I was drunk, so I took the car and I drove. I was really surprised how they just glossed over this. Yeah, they included the information, but they spent time making sure you knew the guy she falsely accused was creepy for hitting on her, which he was, while they completely ignored that she could have killed someone by driving that car. Anyway, eventually Bjorni gets out of her friend's car and goes into the guy's car by herself, which is full of random strangers while she was drunk without telling any of her friends where she was. I mean, if you were trying to stay safe, this is the exact wrong thing to do. She is lucky that none of the guys actually hurt her. 
What ended up happening instead is that they drove around for an hour, couldn't find a party they were looking for, and Bjarni got back to her friends. Then, this happens. When they find her there... Her hair was all hair crazy. Was all her mascara was all runny. She looked like she had been in a struggle. Aurora and the girls are angry they'd been ditched. Bjarni feels cornered and doesn't know what to do. Tensions are high. And then... Out of nowhere, she lashed out at me. We got into a physical fight, which I started it. The fight is an out-and-out -out brawl. Oh my god, the amount of cover-up in this story is incredible. We know the ending, but at this point, ABC still wants you to think that she was assaulted. So far, she stole her friend's car, drove under the influence of alcohol, and then, when she gets back to her friends who are just worried about her, she starts assaulting them. Am I the insane one or did we all hear the same things? How exactly can Chris Cuomo and the ABC team paint this woman as a victim when she literally tries to beat the crap out of her friends when they were just trying to help her. Now for the payload. Bjarni wants to stop the physical fight that, by the way, she started, so she tells her friends that she was assaulted. But the mood changes when Bjarni explains why she's acting this way. She says something terrible happened with the stranger in the back of the van. He pulled off my pants. He was uh, hitting me and he raped me. She was then not mad at you anymore. She was not mad at me anymore because she felt sorry for me. And you wanted that. And that's what I wanted from the beginning. Well, she had been raped. And I'm like feeling like horrible, like just in shock. The girls enraged just moments before are now totally sympathetic. This is the part of all women must be believed that Me Too completely ignores. A ton of women lie about assault out of spite or to make themselves look or feel better or maybe for economic reasons. That's why you can't simply believe everything you hear without evidence. What happens next is Bjarni and her friends go get a rape kit, they call the police, and they find the perpetrator of the assault that didn't actually happen. Detectives from the NYPD Special Victim Squad start investigating. Bjarni repeats to them her nightmare of being brutally raped. Then, in short order, they track down the white van and the guy who'd first jumped in the girl's car, a 28-year-old contractor named William McCaffrey. I can't imagine how sick this person must be. Not only did she lie to her friends and do all this terrible stuff, but she even went and filed a police report and then pressed criminal charges just so her friends would feel sorry for her. Here's the worst part. Let's let our good reporter friend Chris Cuomo tell us the truth of these situations. Did you rape Bjarni? Of course not. Did you assault Bjarni? No, I did not. Did you give her any reason to believe that you were a threat to her? Not at all. Supporting McCaffrey's claims, the rape kit comes back negative. The strongest evidence of a physical attack police have is a bite mark on Bjarni's shoulder. But still, if it comes down to a he said, she said, the cops are probably going to accept what she said. He said, she said is not admissible in court, or at least it shouldn't be. But that's exactly what happened. The New York courts convicted this guy with no evidence other than her story. Let me tell you how bad this really is. Most of these big cases we hear about where a man gets falsely accused get tried in civil court. There's a reason for this. It's because the burden of proof is much lower in civil court than it is in criminal court. And they probably want to pay out. I'm not a lawyer, but I believe it needs to be like 51% likely that the person did what they are being accused of in civil court. You just need a majority of the likelihood. However, in criminal court, you need proof beyond a reasonable doubt, meaning there needs to be like a 95% chance the person did it. So what happened here is that the New York courts took this woman's story, who had no evidence, and said, yeah, that sounds like there was a 95% chance that he did it. Keep in mind that the rape kit didn't produce any evidence against him, and the only other physical evidence was a bite mark that could have easily been from the fight she got into with her friends. McCaffrey maintains his innocence up and through the trial, even taking the stand to defend himself. 
Bjorni maintains his guilt, and almost solely on the basis of her emotional testimony, the jury votes to convict. Again, think of how sick this person is. She told her friends she was raped to stop a fight. Lying to her friends about something that serious was bad enough. Then, she lied to the police, possibly hired a lawyer, and went through a full-blown court case where she lied the entire time. That is a very elaborate ploy just to get a little sympathy. How did this even go through? She said she took the morning after pill because of the alleged rape, which means the rape kit should have pulled out seminal fluid. Otherwise, she would not need emergency contraceptive. All they would have to do is DNA test that and say, not his. The only negative thing they had against him was that he had prior convictions. Their entire argument was based on suspicion and not actual proof. So, an innocent man was convicted. Here's Bjarni's response to the conviction. The sentence, swift and severe. They told me he got convicted 20 years. 20 years. What do you think? I start crying. I just want to get home, be by myself. You just put a guy in jail for 20 years for a crime he didn't commit, and your response was, that was so tough. I just want to go home. Gee, I'm sorry it was so difficult for you. By the way, these things don't just happen randomly. If you've been watching my channel for a while, then you'll know that only child abuse victims do this kind of stuff. As I always say, childhood trauma is not an excuse for you to abuse other people. It is your responsibility as an adult to take care of your mental health so that you don't take out your trauma on other people. Speaking of child abuse, another statement I have made on this channel is that these big news corporations who are trying to manipulate everyone into believing lies know that mental health disease is caused by the broken families that they encourage. Here is them straight up saying that a broken family caused Bjorni to do what she did. Beneath the surface, says Callan, there's a lot from Bjorni's past to explain her behavior. She's originally from a broken and abusive home in the Dominican Republic. She was essentially abandoned by her own family and grew up largely in the streets. The story doesn't end here. While William McCaffrey was rotting in jail, Bjorni got married, she got to have kids, and she got to have fun living her life. Some time goes by and Bjorni starts to feel guilty about the horrendous crime she committed. Supposedly, during a confessional, her Catholic priest convinced her to tell the police that she lied. However, it's not that easy. Despite that Bjorni confessed that she lied, and the New York courts had zero evidence to convict William, they didn't let him go free. But incredibly, the truth does not set him free. Even after hearing Bjorni's recantation, the prosecution refuses to acknowledge they put an innocent man behind bars. Bjorni has to spend six months insisting the rape never happened. Finally, in August 2009, a judge frees William McCaffrey from prison. They kept him in prison for an additional six months, then justice was served. William McCaffrey was let free, and Bjorni was put behind bars for lying. Just a month before her sentencing, Bjorni gives birth to her second son, Daniel. My son, oh my God, he's everything. But despite all that, the court has a hardened heart. And where are we doing this interview? In jail. And how long are you going to be here? They gave me one to three years. Again, ABC framing her as the victim. She just had a kid. Keep in mind that the actual victim, William McCaffrey, also had kids who were separated from him for four years which is crazy because ABC spends so much time talking about her kids and even gives them personal interviews. But they only mention that William has kids once, and he fumbled his words so badly that when he said he had sons, I had to Google a transcript to verify that's what he said. They pretty much said nothing about his kids that he didn't get to see, so why should they bring up hers? Also, how exactly is this whole situation fair? He spent four years in prison for something he didn't do, but she could possibly get out in as soon as a year with good behavior and a maximum sentence that is still less than how long he spent in jail. I don't care if perjury is considered a lesser crime. 
She ruined four years of his life, so four years of her life should be ruined. Another inconvenient truth that feminists don't like to bring up is that women get off completely easy when it comes to criminal convictions compared to men. The only redeeming quality Bjorni had is that she turned herself in. I do have to commend her for that because she could have just gone on with her life and let him rot in jail for the full 20-year sentence. But my God, the amount of effort that ABC and Chris Cuomo put into this report to make this woman look like a hero is insane. The lesson to be learned is you don't accept what people say at face value. Absolutely. That's why we have due process. Because some people lie and taking their word for it with no evidence can cause innocent people to go to jail. If we didn't have due process and people could get away with lying, then there would be far more false accusers than there are right now. That's why you need evidence. A twit longer or sharing your story on Facebook is not good enough. Now there's a lesson we can all learn from this, and that lesson is a lesson in reality. A lot of times it does not matter who was right or who was wrong, because the fact of the matter is that this guy lost four years of his life over something he didn't do. The real answer to this problem is not to vindicate yourself, but instead, it's to not be there in the first place. All William had to do to save four years of his life is not pick up random girls on the street and then bring them into his car. There are plenty of other ways to get women that won't get you me too A powerful lesson you can learn in life is to not put yourself in crappy situations. I'll give you another example with cancel culture. One thing I've noticed is that a lot of people who get deplatformed from some websites or all of big tech got deplatformed right after they were having pointless internet flame wars. This is what happened to Sargon of Akkad and Milo Yiannopoulos with Twitter, and I also believe it's why Stefan Molyneux was deplatformed from big tech. Right before he was deplatformed, he spent a lot of time talking about how he was owning the woke crowd on Twitter. Well, let me ask you, who got the last laugh? I understand that stuff like this was okay in the past, but in the current climate, doing these things is really stupid. You have to understand that this is a game and the rules are unfair, so we need to be smart. Now, this doesn't mean you can't discuss important or controversial topics. Of course you can do that. But the minute the name calling starts, the minute the character attacks start, the minute the conversation gets too heated, that's when you disengage. Once you hit that point, nothing productive will be accomplished. You will never bring that person over to your side, you will never find common ground, and you will never learn anything useful. Each side will go home believing exactly what they believed before the argument, so at best you are wasting your time, at worst you are creating vicious enemies who will do whatever it takes to shut you up. For a content creator, this could result in you losing your social media accounts, or if you are a regular person, this could get you fired from your job. So if you are going to have a discussion with someone you disagree with, then you have to learn how to make it so that conversations don't get to that point, or if they do get to that point, you need to know how to conduct yourself appropriately. Unfortunately, this is a skill you have to build, so I can't just tell you everything in one video. But I will say that there are other videos out there where I have talked about some of the skills that you need to have these discussions work more in your favor. At the very least, if you do get into such an argument, you need to refrain from any name calling or using character attacks. Not only will this lower the temperature of the conversation, but if the other person doesn't have any morals and wants to complain to HR so you get fired for words, it will make it way harder for them to do so. Now sometimes, the Karens who complain to HR are so incessant that you can't get away from them. If that's your entire work culture, then I suggest you tidy up your resume and start applying for new jobs. If it's just one person, then keep in mind that a lot of people at work probably don't like that person either. You have to lean into that. People don't defend people they hate. They only defend people they like. It would be very difficult for a Karen to ruin your life if you were so well liked by everyone at your job that they would all stand up for you. You can make yourself likable by being a hard worker, being kind, and being quick to help people out when they need it. And you should be doing this anyway, because those things have other benefits. But as I said before, we have to be smart about this. The reason good people keep losing to the mob is because these people are playing the game in the mob's territory by using insults instead of sticking to the argument. They want you to insult them, because then they can play victim and tell on you. It doesn't matter if they did the same thing by calling you names because, as I said, the rules are unfair. 
However, if you just stick to the arguments, then you give them no ammunition to attack you, and they can't win because they don't know how to make good arguments. Maybe it'll help if I explain it this way. I play a game called Apex Legends a lot, and one of the lessons you can learn from that game is that if you want to win, then you want to make sure that you are always attacking your opponents when you have an advantage, and you want to try to never engage with them when you are at a disadvantage. For those of you who have never played Apex Legends before, it's a battle royale game that is basically like the Hunger Games. 20 teams enter the arena, each team has 3 players, all of the guns and equipment are randomized throughout the map, and the last team standing wins. Every time you are in combat, you preferably want to do things like position yourself so that you have the high ground. Most people look forward and not up, so being higher up than them makes it easier to surprise them. Higher ground also makes it easier to get headshots for you, while it makes it harder for them. And if you are really high up, it makes it easier to run away and heal if they manage to critically wound you. You also want to put yourself in situations where you're flanking a person or behind them, so they don't have the opportunity to shoot you back while you're shooting them. Or, you want to put yourself in a situation where it's two or three of your guys versus just one of their guys. And preferably, you want to avoid all the situations where someone else tries to do these things to you. That's how you win. In real life, people keep losing these fights because they are trying to defeat the woke mob, while the woke mob has huge advantages. Don't fight in their territory or play their game. Make them play yours by learning how to handle these engagements properly. That way you set all the rules and you have all the advantages. But with that said, I think that's enough for this video. So if you liked it, hit the like button, subscribe if you're new, comment and share. If you would like to support this channel, then you can do so with PayPal, Patreon, or Subscribestar. You can find all of those links in the description. Last, if you haven't checked me out on BitChute, Mines, or Parlor, you can also find those links in the description. Otherwise, Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.